to make industry less destructive activities such as reduce avoid minimize sustain limit and halt have long been on the main agendas of the environmentalist but how did they start as the industry spread people started noticing changes in nature at the end of the 18th century thomas malthus an influential economist published a book an essay on the principle of population predicting the exponential growth of human population and warning that it would bring devastating consequences for humankind it was at the time when population growth was viewed as a positivity George Perkins Mars, as some consider him the father of the environmental movement, was one of the first to understand man's capacity for lasting destruction on the environment. His most famous book, Man and Nature, published in 1864, highlighted the importance of a harmonious relationship between the humankind and the natural world, and warned of the negative impact if natural resources is used up too quickly. The book made an enormous positive impact on the foresters, artists, thinkers, and conservationists. Later, Aldo Leopold, an ecologist and naturalist, expressed some feelings of guilt in his publication. He wrote, "When I submit these thoughts to a printing press, I am helping cut down the woods. When I pour cream in my coffee, I am helping to drain a marsh for cows to graze and to exterminate the birds of Brazil." When I go birding or hunting in my fold, I'm devastating an oil field and re-electing an imperialism to get me rubber. Nay more, when I father more than two children, I'm creating as insatiable need for more printing presses, more cows, more coffee, more oil to supply with more birds, more trees, and more flowers will either be killed or evicted from their several environments. As a result, Conservation societies such as Sierra Club and the Wilderness Society were established that help preserve wilderness and keep it safe from industrial growth. The definition of environmentalism at that time was very limited though. It was mainly about protesting deforestation, mining destruction, factory pollution and other visible changes and seeking to preserve especially appreciated landscapes. However, It wasn't until really later the publications of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962 when she pointed out that human-made chemicals particularly pesticides such as DDT were bad for the natural world. Almost a decade later, Silent Spring led to the banning of DDT in the United States and Germany. Seriously, scientists and politicians formed groups such as Environmental Defense the Natural Resources Defense Council, the World Wildlife Federation, and the Bund, that's the German Federation for Environmental and Nature Conservation. By this point, environmentalists were no longer only interested to preserve, but in monitoring and reducing toxins. Shortly after Silent Spring in 1968, Paul Ehrle, a pioneer of modern environmentalism and an eminent biologist, published The Population Bomb, in which he predicted that 1970s and 1980s would see a resource shortage expecting the death of hundreds of millions of people. Additionally, he also pointed out humans have it of using atmosphere as a garbage dump. He asked, "What do we gain by playing environmental roulette?" In 1972, Donella and Dennis Meadows and the Club of Rome published another serious warning: the limits to growth. The authors noted that resources were depleting due to population growth and concluded, if the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limit to growth on this planet will reach sometime within the next 100 years. In 1984, Early published another book with his wife Annie, The Population Explosion, stating then the fuse was burning, now the population bomb has detonated. They pointed out the primary cause of our planet's unease is the overgrowth of the human population and its impact on both ecosystem and human communities. As these environmentalists were issuing an important warning, suggestions were being made the ways consumers could reduce their negative impact on the environment. In 1998 book Useless Stuff Environmental Solutions for Who We Really Are, 
Robert Lillianfield and William Raths mentioned, the best way to reduce any environmental impacts is not to recycle more, but to produce and dispose of less. But industry was not listening to them, and it stayed like this until the industry began to realize the harm they were creating, and it wasn't until decades later. In a response, the Rio Earth Summit happened in 1992 where approximately 30,000 people from 167 countries gathered in Rio de Janeiro. The group's report stressed the importance of eco-efficiency for all companies that aim to be competitive, sustainable, and successful in the long term by making the machines that has cleaner, faster, quieter engines. Although many big corporations such as 3M and Johnson & Johnson adopted the term in their business models, to their disappointment, the definition of ecosystem was too vague. Now let's try to understand what exactly is eco-efficiency. The definition eco-efficiency means doing more with less. But that still doesn't say much, right? How much of a less is less? To understand this, let's look at the famous environmental movement, that is 4 R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and regulate. Reduce. Whether it's a matter of eliminating toxic waste or cutting down the use of raw materials, the reduction is one of the main points of eco-efficiency. But having said that, the reduction does not stop depletion and destruction completely. In fact, it only slows them down. Reuse Another waste reduction strategy is incineration, which has better reputation than landfilling due to waste to energy conversion. But waste in incinerator burn only because valuable materials like paper and plastic are flammable. For once, we have to think that since these materials were never designed to be safely burned, they release toxins. Although many industries and customers feel good if they find a way to reuse waste, but in many cases, this waste and many toxins are simply being transferred to another place. Unless materials are specifically designed to ultimately become safe food for nature, even biodegradable waste, when composted, can release the chemicals and toxins in the materials. Recycling now let's talk about recycling. Most recycling is actually downcycling, which means it reduces the quality of material over time. For example, the high quality steel used in automobiles is recycled by melting it down with other car parts, including copper, paints, and plastic. As a result, the quality of material goes down. To make up for the lost quality, more high quality steel may be added to make the hybrid strong enough for the next use. But still, it will not provide the same material properties to make a new car again. Another good example is a soda can, which consists of two kinds of aluminium. The wall is composed of aluminium, magnesium alloy with some magnesium, plus coating and paint, while the harder top is aluminium magnesium alloy. Now imagine what happens when these materials are mixed together. Their properties change. That's exactly what happens in conventional recycling. These materials are melted together in order to be recycled and resulting in a weaker and less useful product. Lost value and lost materials are not the only concern here. One good example is of plastics. When some plastics are melted and combined, the polymers in the plastics, the chains that make it strong and flexible, are shortened. Since the material properties of this recycled plastic are altered, chemical and mineral additives may be added to attain the desired performance quality. As a result, downcycled plastic may have more additives than virgin waste. And last but not least, recycling is actually more expensive because it tries to force materials into more lifetime than they were originally designed for, hence requiring more energy and resources. Regulate Regulate means we all have to remember our responsibilities, be it the government or the public. Do we need a stronger law or can we just be a nice person and follow the 3R rules? But the problem is, there isn't enough guidance for the public. The explanation of how to save the environment is as vague as the definition of eco-efficient. Eco-efficient is a definitely admirable concept, but it is not a strategy to success over a long time because it does not reach deep enough. Relying on eco-efficiency to save the environment will in fact achieve the opposite. It will let the industry finish up everything, quietly, persistently, and completely. Now let's look at how it would look like if we design a system with keeping eco-efficient in mind. 
release fewer pounds of toxic waste every year, measure prosperity by this activity, meet the conditions of thousands of regulations to keep people and natural system from being poisoned too quickly, produce fewer materials that are so dangerous that they will require future generations to maintain constant resilience while living in terror, result in smaller amount of useless waste, put a smaller amount of valuable materials in holes all over the planet where they can never be retrieved. Efficient at what? Here's a nice example. In Germany, 20 years ago, the standard rate of oil used for heating and cooling the average house was 30 liters per square meter per year. Today, with high efficient housing, it is 1.5 liters of oil per square meter. This increase in efficiency is often achieved due to better insulation and smaller leak-proof windows. Although these strategies are meant to optimize the system and reduce wasted energy, this actually reduces air exchange rates which intensifies the concentration of indoor air pollution from poorly designed materials. Another example from Turkey shows that efficient building can also be dangerous. Several years ago, Turkey's government designed and constructed inexpensive housing which were built efficiently with a minimum of steel and concrete. During 1999 earthquakes, this building easily collapsed while other inefficient buildings held up better. What about agriculture? In the past, efficient agriculture is seen depleting local landscape and wildlife. Take a look at the example of Germany again. During the time when there were West Germany and East Germany, the West produced double the amount of wheat per acre than East because agricultural industry in the West was more efficient and modern. However, the eastern efficient and more old-fashioned agriculture was actually better for the environment as it has larger wetland areas that have not been drained and overtaken by monocultural crops and they contain more rare species. Last but not least, this does not mean efficient is bad at all. When being implemented as a tool within a larger efficient system that intends overall positive effects on a wide range of issues, Eco-efficiency can actually be a valuable one. It can be used as to slow down current system and turn around. So what do we do? We should make the goal where there is zero waste, zero emissions, and zero ecological footprint. Thank you for watching. In the next chapter, we go deep into eco-effectiveness. Eco-effectiveness. Let's look at an example of a cherry tree. During springtime, have you seen thousands of cherry trees blossoming? Well, these beautiful trees are not only a pleasure to our eyes, but they also create fruit for birds, humans, and other animals without depleting their environment. Once they fall on the ground, their materials decompose and break down into nutrients for microorganisms, insects, plants, animals, and soil, just about everything around it. Now, just imagine what would the workspace building look like if it was like a cherry tree. It would look like this. A building would get a maximum of daytime light. It would contain a large window with plenty views of the outdoor. Each of the occupants would have five views from wherever he or she happens to sit. Delicious affordable food and drinks would be available to employees in a cafe that opens onto a sun-filled courtyard. Each employee can control the flow of fresh air and the temperature of their breathing zones in the office. The window opens, the cooling system maximizes natural air flows. At night, the system would flush the building with cool evening air. A layer of native plants would cover the building's roof, making it more attractive to songbirds and absorbing water runoff, while at the same time protecting the roof from thermal shock and ultraviolet degradation. Although this building is a perfect example of being efficient, it might cost more during construction. For example, windows that open are more expensive than windows that do not. However, the nighttime cooling strategy cuts down on the need of air conditioning. Employees have the advantage of fresh air and makes the indoor spaces more pleasurable, hence providing productive work. So in a long run, it's always more beneficial. These buildings represent only the beginnings of eco-effective design 
and this is the difference between eco-efficiency and eco-effectiveness. Eco-efficiency tells us to use fewer materials but eco-effectiveness tells us to use the material with the maximum advantage so that we have benefits in the long run. The concept of eco-effectiveness means working on the right things, on the right products and the services and the system instead of making the wrong things less bad. If we went along with the model of efficiency, there would be fewer cherry blossom and fewer nutrients, fewer trees, less oxygen and less clean water. Not only that, fewer songbirds, less diversity, less creativity and delight. The marvelous thing about effective systems is that we want more of them, not less. What is growth? Although industrial growth is not seen as a beautiful thing by the environmentalist, we all have to remember that not every growth is a bad thing. For example, we want to grow education, prosperity, clean water, and quality of life, not ignorance, sickness, and poisoned water. The important thing is to design human industries so that we get bigger and better, just like our cherry tree. Another great example is a community of ants. As a part of their daily activity, they safely and effectively handle their material waste and those of other species grow and harvest their food while nurturing the ecosystem of which they are a part, construct houses, farms, dumps, cemeteries, living quarters, and food storage facilities from materials that can be truly recycled, create disinfectants and medicines that are healthy, safe, and biodegradable, maintain soil health for the entire planet. Ants are a good example of a population whose density and productiveness are not a problem for the rest of the world because everything they make and use returns to the cradle to cradle cycles of nature. Like the cherry tree, they make the world a better place. Once upon a roof, conventional roofing surfaces are exposed to the sun all day, being prone to ultraviolet degradation and constant thermal shock. Now, what would be an effective roof? It's a light layer of soil covered with plant, more like a roof of Chicago City Hall, which maintains a stable temperature at the roof, providing free evaporative cooling in hot weather and insulation in a cold weather, and seals it from the sun's destructive rays, making it last longer. A part of the roof is engineered to produce solar-generated electricity. Also, this roof looks more attractive and even saves it from being degrading. Becoming a native. It always becomes debate when people are talking about finding life on another planet. The idea of colonizing a new planet is appealing, but humans evolved on the earth and we are meant to be here. Its atmosphere, its nutrients, its natural cycles and our biological systems evolve together and support us here. While we recognize the great scientific value of space, exploration and the exciting potential of discovery there, we have to be cautious not to make a big mess here and go somewhere else, less hospitable, even if we figure out how. This does not mean that we don't support the current technological state. It is important to leave some natural places to thrive on their own without undue human interference or habitation. The new design assignment. Here's an old joke about efficiency. An olive oil vendor returns from the marketplace and complains to his friend. I can't make money selling olive oil. By the time I feed the donkey that carries my oil to market, most of my profit is gone. His friend suggests he feed the donkey a little less. Six weeks later, they meet again at the marketplace. The oil seller is in poor shape with neither money nor donkey. When his friends ask what happened, the vendor replies, Well, I did as you said. I fed the donkey a little less and I began to do really well. So I fed him even less and I did even better. But just at the point when it was becoming more successful, he died. Being eco-effective does not mean we have to starve ourselves. We first have to understand what it means and how to be eco-effective. In fact, here are some frameworks of eco-effectiveness as a takeaway gift. Buildings that, like trees, produce more energy than they consume and purify their wastewater. Factories that produce effluents that are drinking water. Products that, when their useful life is over, do not become useless waste, but can be tossed onto the ground to decompose and become food for plants and animals, and nutrients for soil, and alternatively, that can be returned to industrial cycles to supply high-quality raw materials for new products. Billions or even trillions of dollars worth of materials occurred for human and natural purposes each year. 
transportation that improves the quality of life while delivering goods and services. A world of abundance, not one of the limits, pollution and waste. Most importantly, every time we think about designing something, we should always remember the cherry tree. Thank you for watching us. The next chapter would be about waste equals food. Waste equals food. If we just take an example of nature, it operates according to a system of nutrients and metabolism in which there is no such thing as waste. Remember our cherry tree? The tree doesn't only look beautiful, but it also provides food and oxygen to humans and animals and nutrients to organisms and microorganisms. This is an example of cradle to cradle, the system that has nourished a planet for millions of years. But as industrialization happened, humans took, altered and synthesized the earth's crust in a way that cannot be safely returned to soil. The material flows in the current situation can be divided into two categories, biological and technical. Biological materials are any material that come from nature and can go back to nature, whereas technical materials come from materials used in industrial process. But how did we come from cradle to cradle to cradle to grave? Let's look at the brief history. From cradle to cradle to cradle to grave, a brief history of nutrients flow. Long before the rise of agriculture, humans made their needs from local materials, which were then easily decomposed and be consumed by nature when their use was over. The biological waste could be left behind to replenish soil, which was replacing nutrients. However, the rise of industrialization led to the adoption of new agricultural tools and techniques for quicker food production. Population increased and many communities began to take more resources and nutrients than could be restored. As more people were packed in a tiny amount of land, sanitation became a huge problem. Now the societies had to take care of their waste and you know, the rest is the history. Slowly, the increase in population led to the incredible pressure on the environment and use up of materials and resources from the land, from near as well as far away. New infrastructures were built all over the cities to transfer nutrients from place to place. Before we knew, houses and roads started competing for space with agriculture. In the 19th and early 20th century, synthetic fertilizers were developed Lands started producing more crops than they usually did, but with severe effect. With the availability of synthetic fertilizers, very few farmers returned to local biological waste as a primary source of nutrients any longer. In pre-industrial culture, people safely biodegraded their waste once they were used. Technical nutrients such as metals were the exception. These were seen as highly valuable and were melted down and reused. Then came the Great Depression, where people were careful about reusing jars, jugs, foils. And during World War II, people saved rubber bands, aluminum foil, steel and other materials to feed industrial needs. But as cheaper materials and new synthetic flooded the post-war market, it became less expensive for industries to make a new aluminum plastics or glass bottle or packets at a central plant and ship it out than to build up local infrastructures for collecting, transporting and cleaning. Monstrous Hybrids The major problem of cradle to grave design was not the mountains of waste rising in landfills but the nutrients because they were not rescued after they were used up once. One example of monotrous hybrid is a conventional leather shoe. At one time, shoes were tanned with vegetable chemicals, which were relatively safe. The shoe could biodegrade after its useful life or be safely burned. But vegetable tanning required that trees be harvested for their tannins. As a result, shoes took a long time to make and they were expensive. In the past 40 years, vegetable tanning has been replaced with chromium tanning, which is faster and cheaper. But chromium is rare and valuable for industries, and in some forms it is carcinogenic. Today, shoes are often tanned in developing countries where few if any precautions were taken to protect people and ecosystem. Besides, manufacturing waste may be dumped into nearby bodies of water or incinerated, either of which distributes toxins. A confusion of flows. Before modern sewage system, 
people would bury them or dispose of them in bodies of water, sometimes even contaminated the drinking sources. It wasn't until the late 19th century that people began to make the connection between sanitation and public health, which provided the urgent impulse for sorting out sewage system. The original idea was to take relatively active biological-based sewage, principally from humans, and render it harmless. The solids were removed as sludge and the remaining liquid could be released essentially as water. That was the original strategy. But people began to pour all kind of things down the drain, and the waste itself now carried antibiotics and even waste, cleaners, chemicals, and other substances that will join chemical and biological substances. If we are going to design systems of effluence that goes into the environment, then perhaps we ought to design so that it goes as a part of nutrients flow. For example, the mineral phosphate is used as a fertilizer for crops around the world. Typical fertilizer uses phosphate that is mined from the rock, but extracting it is extremely destructive to the environment. But phosphate also occurs naturally in sewage sludge and other organic waste. What if we could design a system that safely captures the phosphate already in circulation, rather than discarding it as a sludge? A world of two metabolisms. Our life's basic needs depend on two essential elements, mass, which is the earth, and energy, the sun. This means whatever in here in the closed system is all we have and whatever we make within this closed system does not go away. If our systems contaminate Earth's biological mass and continue to throw away technical materials, we will indeed live in a world of limits and the Earth will literally become a grave. As already mentioned, there are two discrete metabolism on the planet. The first is the biological metabolism and the second is the technical. With the right design, all the products and materials manufactured by industry will safely feed these two metabolisms, providing nourishment for something new. Products can be composed either of materials that biodegrade and become food for biological cycles, or of technical materials that stay in a closed-loop technical cycles in which they continually circulate as valuable nutrients for industry. In order for these two metabolisms to remain healthy, valuable, and successful, great care must be taken to avoid contaminating one with the other. Things that go into the organic metabolism must not contain mutagens, carcinogens, persistent toxins, or other substances that accumulate in natural systems. In the same way, biological nutrients are not designed to be fed into the technical metabolism. Now, let's look at the biological and technical metabolism deep in detail. The biological metabolism. The idea is clear here. We have to design a fabric that would not harm people who breathe in. A biological nutrient is a material or product that is designed to be used and then literally consumed by microorganisms in the soil and by other animals. Most packaging, which makes up to 50% of the volume of the municipal solid waste stream, can be designed as biological nutrients. For example, if a juice doesn't even last a week, why do we need a juice container that lasts decades? Why should individuals and communities be burdened with downcycling or landfilling such materials? In fact, as a biological nutrient, it would feed the nature. Wouldn't it be so great that after customers finished using it, they would simply tear the fabric or materials off and throw it onto the soil without feeling bad? Throwing something away can be fun, let's admit it and giving a guilt-free gift to the natural world is an incomparable pleasure. The technical metabolism A technical nutrient is a material or product that is designed to go back into the industrial metabolism from which it came. Some of them are toxic, which are wasted, but others are valuable nutrients for industry that ends up in a landfill. Isolating them from biological nutrients allows them to be upcycled rather than recycled to retain their high quality in a closed-loop industrial cycle. For example, when a vehicle is discarded, its component steel is recycled as an amalgam of all its steel parts along with the various steel alloys of other products. The vehicle is crushed, pressed, and processed so that high ductile steel from the body and stainless steels are melted together with various other scrap steels and materials, compromising their high quality and drastically restricting their further use. As a human, we love the idea of being powerful, honor, and unique, which means buying things that are brand new with a virgin material is part of our nature. 
what our Dr. Green thinks, in order for our zero waste scenario to be practical, we have to introduce a concept that goes hand in hand with the notion of technical nutrient, the concept of product of service. Instead of assuming that all products are to be bought and disposed of by consumers, product containing valuable technical nutrients, for example cars, televisions, computers, and refrigerators would be redistributed as services. In this scenario, Dr. Green wants to watch TV. He effectively buys the service of such a product for a defined user period, let's say 10,000 hours of TV viewing, rather than the product itself. Now everyone is happy, Dr. Green, manufacturer, service provider, and the environment, as they all handle the service they need for as long as they need them and could upgrade as often as desired. Under this scenario, people could indulge their hunger for new products as often as they wish without feeling guilty. Car manufacturers would want people to turn in their old cars in order to regain valuable industrial nutrients. In the normal scenario, a customer comes and buys a car. As he drives off in a new car, never to enter the dealership again, the manufacturer is waving industrial resources goodbye. Instead, the companies could develop lasting and valuable relationships that enhance customers' quality of life for many decades and that continually enrich the industry itself with industrial food. Industry does not need to design what it takes to be durable beyond a certain amount of time, any more than nature does. The advantages of this system, when fully implemented, are enormous. It would produce no useless and potentially harmful waste. It would save manufacturers billions of dollars in valuable materials over time. When worlds collide If a product must, for a time being, remain a monotrous hybrid, it may take extra ingenuity to design and market it to have positive consequences for both biological and technical metabolisms. Running shoes, for example, can be redesigned so that their soles are biological nutrients. Then when they break down their pounding feet, they will feed the organic metabolism instead of poisoning it. The shoes should also be designed for easy disassembly in order to be safely recirculated in both cycles. Having said that, some materials do not fit into either the biological or technical metabolism because they contain materials that are hazardous. For example, nuclear waste and until technological ways of detoxifying them have been developed, they also require creative measures. Upcycling to remove the antimony residues and to create a clean waste and nutrients would be preferable when they will eventually be disposed of to enter natural system and nutrients flow. The materials in certain monotrous hybrid could be similarly gathered and separated. For example, in the textile industry, cotton could be composted out of polyester cotton textile blends and the polyester then returned to technical cycles. Making this successful transition requires leadership in these areas without negligence. Thank you for listening. In the next chapter, we will be talking about respect diversity. In this chapter, we look into how just by respecting diversity, we can achieve huge profits and incredible benefits from the natural energy flows. By respecting diversity means to include not only biodiversity, but also diversity of place and culture. This means, for example, engaging with an abundance of diverse materials, options, and responses of creative and elegant solutions. The fittest survive, the fitting est tribe. Popular wisdom says the fittest survive, but in a healthy natural system is the fittingest who thrive. Fittingest implies something that fits in the place with an energetic engagement and interdependent relationship. Think again of the ants. Being fitting, ants do not work to destroy competing species. Rather, they compete productively from their niches and use resources within an ecosystem. Over millions of years, ants have evolved to fit with their particular local, developing features and behaviors they need. The vitality of ecosystems depend on relationship between species, their uses and exchanges of materials and energy in a given space. The more diversity there is, the more productive functions for the ecosystem is performed. Every creature is involved in maintaining the entire system 
and each inhabitant of an ecosystem is therefore interdependent to some extent with the others. A small disturbance of this ecosystem means an ecosystem becomes less stable, less able to withstand natural catastrophe and less able to stay healthy. All sustainability is local. We know the human systems and industries are fitting only when we understand the total meaning of all sustainability is local. This means connecting to local material and energy flows and local customs, needs and tastes from the molecular level to the level of the region itself. This includes considering the effects of the chemicals we use in the local water and soil, understanding the product we are using, the surrounding in which it is made, how we can create meaningful occupation and enhance the region's economic and physical health. And finally, how we can acquire biological and technical wealth for the future. This would enhance that particular community in several ways. The homes were built from local materials that were biologically and technically reusable. Employing these materials and the services of nearby craftsmen would generate local economic activity and support as many residents as possible. It would involve local people in building the community and keep them connected to the region's cultural heritage. Additionally, using local materials open the doors to profitable local enterprise. It also avoids the problem of bio-invasion, when a transfer of materials from one region to another introduces invasive non-native species to fragile ecosystem. By seeing sustainability as both a local and global event, we can understand that it's not viable to poison local water and air with waste and it's equally unacceptable to send it downstream or to ship it to overseas to other countries. Connecting to natural energy flows With new technologies and the use of fossil fuels, the industrial revolution made humans no longer dependent on natural force. As a result, modern homes, buildings and factories even whole cities became so disconnected from natural energy flows. A renewed connection to natural flows will help us make use of existing local renewable energy flows while more optimized solutions are being developed and implemented. In some cases, solar, wind and water power can be channeled into the current system of energy supplies. In the long run, connecting to natural energy flows is a matter of re-establishing our fundamental connection to the source of all good growth on the planet. For example, the sun. Even at such distance, it commands healthy circumstances that make natural energy flows possible. Human tribe on the earth under such intense heat and light only because billions of years of evolutionary processes have created the atmosphere and surface that support our existence lives on Earth. So, re-establishing our connection to the Sun includes maintaining interdependence with all other ecological circumstances that make natural energy flows possible in the first place. A transition to diverse and renewing energy flows. Similar to the diversity, a distributed industry makes a resilient system for both providers and customers. And from an eco-effective perspective, the greatest innovations in energy supply are being made by small-scale plants at the local level. The shorter distances reduce the power lost in high-voltage transmission to insignificant levels. With smaller utilities, it becomes possible to harness waste heat to feed local needs. Rather than installing more large-scale power generating equipment to meet peak energy loads, utility companies can integrate solar collectors as products of service with systems currently in use. Or imagine having an intelligent appliance that receives information about the current price of power along with the power itself, and you get to choose from alternative power sources accordingly, like a broker instructed to sell or buy according to the rise and fall of given stock price. Wouldn't that be great? In this way, your appliance could decide according to your criteria when to buy power and when to use the restored cooling system until demand and price come down. Another great possible example would be a thermostat that can be placed near employees, not in the equipment up near the roof. This way, people are heating or cooling small area as needed instead of whole floor itself. What would be the cherry on the cake is to combine such a system with a grass roof to protect it from heat gain in summer, wind loss in the winter, and the wear and tear of daylight. Reap the wind. 
Wind power offers similar possibilities for hybrid systems that make more effective use of local resources. From an eco-effective perspective, however, the design of conventional wind power plants is not always optimal. The new wind farms are huge, as many as 100 windmills grouped, each of them producing 1 megawatt of electricity with a blade length of a football field. Also, modern wind fields are not designed as technical nutrients with ecologically intelligent materials. In this case, what we can do is to distribute windmills on every few family farms. As with solar collectors, utility companies could lease land from the farmers for this purpose, distributing the power they generate in a way that optimizes existing power lines and requires a few new ones. The farmers get much needed supplemental income and the utility company gets to reap the power which it adds to the grid. Ultimately, we want to be designing processes and products that not only return the biological and technical nutrients they use, but pay back with interest the energy they consume. A diversity of needs and desires. Respecting diversity in design means considering not only how a product is made, but also how it is being used and by whom. In a cradle-to-cradle -cradle concept, it should have many uses and many users over time. An office building or a store, for example, should be designed so that it can be adapted to different users over many generations, instead of built for one specific purpose and torn down later. In industrial areas, polymers can be designed as food for more bottles with an appropriately designed upcycling infrastructure. Imagine designing such packaging that safely biodegrade after use. It could be made from the empty rice stalks that are left in the fields after harvest, which are now usually burned. Instead of feeling guilty and burdened when they are finished eating, people could enjoy throwing their safe and healthy packets out onto the ground, where it could quickly decompose and provide nitrogen to the soil. Form follows evolution. Instead of promoting a one-size-fits-all concept, industries can design in the potential for mass customization, allowing packaging and products to be adapted to local taste and tradition. Luxury industries like fashion and cosmetics have been forward in allowing for customization to individual tastes and local customs. Eco-effective design demands a coherent set of principles based on nature's law and the opportunity for constant diversity of expression. As we have pointed out in Chapter 3, soap, as it is currently manufactured, is designed to work the same way in every imaginable location and ecosystem. Faced with the questionable effects of such a design, eco-efficiency advocates might ask a manufacturer why this packaging in the first place, why these ingredients, why liquid, and why one size fits all. Soap manufacturers could retain local packaging and shipping. For example, shipping water increases transportation expenses and is unnecessary since there is water in the washing machine, laundry, top, river or lake where the washing is done. Maybe soap could be delivered in pellet or powder form and sold in bulk at the grocery store. With given the opportunity, people choose diversity because it brings them more pleasure and delight. In fact, the furious class of cultural diversity can broaden perspective and inspire creative change. A tapestry of information. Traditionally, companies have relied on feedback for signals that influence change. But how about consulting feed forward, asking what will work in the future? How can we design things in keeping with that vision? How will sustaining goal commerce look like in 10 or even 100 years from now? What can we do now to begin the process of industrial revolution? Re if that laundry detergent manufacturer continued to think in this direction, it would move beyond the question of creating a detergent that's convenient to use and be gentle on human hands and not be harmful to aquatic life at the same time. After we know what kind of soap the customers want, what kind of soap the river wants, we have to think about how the packaging can be designed so that it will be readily biodegrade on the river bank. One by one, the elements of a product might be redefined positively against an ever-widening backdrop until the product itself evolves and every aspect is designed to nourish a diverse world. Respecting diversity means widening the scope of input too, to accept a broader range of ecological and social context and a long temporal framework.
a diversity of isms. Capitalism, socialism, culturalism, sexism, or racism. There are many isms that have heavily influenced human history up to now. Sometimes people have their own biased opinions because of which they often become extremists promoting troublesome, low-tech, and impossibly expensive design and policies. Promoting diversity means becoming open-minded and accepting changes that the sustainable world needs. In the process of doing so, at various stages, we sometimes have to make a decision that engages multiple interested factors. To make the process of engaging the various issues less abstract, as a guidance, the fractal triangle is suggested as a visualization tool. It is a simple triangle considering the impact of economy, equity, and ecology together. Starting with the extreme lower right corner, which represents the economy, money becomes the priority here. And the questions we ask would certainly include, can I make a profit with my product or service? In the economic equity sector, we have to consider both profitability and fairness. Asking, are employees producing a promising product earning a living wage? Moving into the equity economy sector, the emphasis shifts more towards fairness so that we can see the economy through the lens of equity. Here, we might ask, are men and women being paid the same for the same work? In the extreme equity corner, the questions are purely social. For example, are people treating each other with respect? This is where we discuss issues such as racism or sexism. Moving to equity ecology sector, the emphasis shifts again. Here the question might be, is it fair to expose workers or customers to toxins in the workplace? In the ecology equity sector, the emphasis is more on how this product is going to affect future generations' health. If it is fair to pollute a river or poison the air. Now going to the ecology sector, are we owing nature's law? Does waste equal food? Then on to ecology economy, where money enters the frame again. The questions we often ask here are, is our ecological economically fecund too? Are we designing a building that harnesses solar flows to make more energy than it needs to operate? Finally, economy ecology sector. This is where eco-efficiency is coming from, where we find people trying to be less bad, do more with less while continuing to work within existing economic paradigm. Our main interest here are the interest of commerce and the environment should not be inherently in conflict. The triple top line. The conventional design criteria are a tripod. Cost, aesthetic, and performance. This means we are prepared to answer, can we profit from it? Will the customer find it attractive? And will it work? This triple bottom line approach is based on the tripod of ecology, equity, and economy. This approach has had a major positive effect on incorporating sustainability concerns into corporate accountability. But in reality, we often find that big decisions are based solely on economic consideration, with social or ecological benefits considered as less important rather than given equal weight at the outset. Businesses calculate their conventional economic profitability and add to that what they perceive to be the social benefits, with perhaps some reduction in environmental damage such as lower emissions, fewer materials sent to a landfill, or reduced materials in the product itself. But if businesses are not using triple bottom line analysis as a strategic design tool, they are missing a rich opportunity. An industrial re-evolution. Inventive machines that use the mechanisms of nature instead of harsh chemicals, concrete or steel, are a step in the right direction. The new technologies do not create industrial revolutions themselves, unless we change their context. Even today, most cutting-edge environmental approaches still lead to the slow destruction of the natural world while we sustain the current industrial system of production and consume for a few hundred years more. Natural systems take from the environment, but they also give something back. Remember our cherry tree? It blossoms, provides food to plants, animals and humans, makes oxygen and finally nutrients to microorganisms. We follow their path to create a more inspiring partnership with nature. We can build the factories whose products and byproducts nourish the ecosystem with biodegradable materials and recirculate technical materials instead of dumping, burning or burying them. We can design the systems that regulate themselves. 
Instead of using nature as a mere tool for human purposes, we can strive to become tools of nature because we have the right system, a creative, prosperous, intelligent and fertile system. Thank you for listening. The next and final chapter of the Cradle to Cradle book is Putting Eco-Effectiveness into Practice. Transformation to an eco-effective vision does not happen at once, and it requires plenty of trial and error, time, effort, money, and creativity extended in many directions. In this final chapter of the Cradle to Cradle book, we will be looking at five steps to put eco-effectiveness into practice. Step 1. Get free of known culprit. A move towards eco-effectiveness means we have to say no to the substances that are widely recognized as harmful. In our daily life, we are so used to hearing products advertised as phosphate-free, lead-free and fragrance-free. But it is important to acknowledge the potential state of the approach and the less visible problems it may conceal. The substance may be phosphate-free, but have they been replaced by something worse? Simply, being free of one does not necessarily make a product healthy and safe. Moreover, the package could contain other harmful substances such as harmful coating or heavy metals in the ink used to print on it. It is possible that the manufacturer increased sales and saved money and effort by simply announcing that the packaging was culprit free. But these culprits could get mixed in the food product itself, which can be very costly for both the manufacturers and the consumers. Additionally, some substances are known to be bioaccumulative, and getting free of them is always a productive and crucial step. Some substances belong to what we call X list, and they include materials such as PVC, cadmium, lead, and mercury. More information about this list comes at step 3. For now, talking about known culprits, the decision to create products that are free of harmful substances is the fundamental of what we call a design filter, which is fairly crude, equivalent to the decision not to include any items that might be harmful to human and environment. Step 2. Follow informed personal preferences. Imagine someone is designing the green offices and they have to use some not clearly specified ingredients from the manufacturer. In this case, they have to ask the manufacturers about the ingredients. If they don't get the clear answer, they have to make choices based on their limited amount of information. This means the materials they use might not be completely green and as a result, it can have some lasting effects. We are standing in the middle of an enormous marketplace filled with largely undefined ingredients and it makes everyone's life difficult. Sometimes we may find ourselves choosing between a petrochemical based fabric and all natural cotton that was produced with the help of large amounts of petrochemically generated nitrogen fertilizers and strip mined radioactive phosphates, not to mention insecticides and herbicides. But in the meantime, there are three ways we can follow to make better choices. Preferring ecological intelligence. Be as sure as you can that a product or substance does not contain substances and support practices that are harmful to human and environmental health. When working on a building, for example, the architects might prefer to use sustainably harvested wood. Even in the case if they have not seen the particular forest where they are harvesting and they don't know how deep their commitment to sustainability goes. But if they decide to go with the product based on what they know best at the given time, the results would probably be better than had they not thought about the issue at all. In general, we should prefer products that can be taken back to the manufacturer and disassembled for reuse in technical production. If we want chemical products, we should choose the one with fewer additives, especially stabilizer and antioxidants. Preferring respect. The issue of respect is at the heart of eco-effective design, and although it is a difficult quality to quantify, it is manifested on several different levels, such as by respecting those who make the product, the communities near where it is made, those who handle and transport it, and ultimately the customer who use it. People's reasons for making choices in the marketplace are not rational. 
and can easily be manipulated. For example, people like the idea of buying something that makes them feel special and smart, and they stay away from the products that make them feel unintelligent. We are wise to beware of our motivations when choosing materials, and we also can look for the materials whose advertising matches their inside, again, as indicative of a broader commitment to the issues that concern us. Preferring delight, celebration, and fun. Another element we can attempt to assess, and perhaps the most readily apparent, is pleasure or delight. Ecologically intelligent products need to be at the front front of human expression. They can express the best of design creativity, adding pleasure and delight to life. Certainly, they can accomplish more than simply making the customer feel guilty or bad in some way while immediate decisions are being made. Step 3. Creating a passive positive list. This is the point at which design begins to become fully eco-effective. Going beyond existing, we conduct a detailed inventory of the entire materials used in a given product and the substances it may give off in the course of its manufacture and use. The questions we ask here are, are they toxic, maybe carcinogenic, how is the product used and what is its end state, what are the effects on the local and global communities. Once screened, substances are placed on the following list that assign greater or less urgency to problematic substances. The X list. This is the list of the most problematic ones. Those are teratogenic, mutagenic, carcinogenic or harmful in direct and indirect ways to humans and the environment. Some example materials are asbestos, benzene, vinyl chloride, antimony trioxide and chromium. Substances placed on the X list are considered the highest priorities for the complete phase out and if necessary and possible replacement. The grade list. Now this is not so urgent list. The list includes problematic substances that are essential for manufacture and for which we currently have no viable substitutes. Cadmium, for example, is highly toxic. But for the time being, it continues to be used in the production of photovoltaic solar collectors. If these are made and marketed as products of service, with the manufacturer retaining ownership of the cadmium molecules as a technical nutrient, we might even consider this an appropriate, safe use of the material at least until we can rethink the design of solar collectors more profoundly. The P list. This is our positive or preferred list that includes substances actively defined as healthy and safe for use. Some checklists we consider are acute oral or inhalation toxicity, chronic toxicity, is the substance a strong sensitizer, is the substance a known or suspected carcinogen or mutagen disruptor, water or soil toxicity, etc. For example, a manufacturer of polyester fabric, having discovered that the blue dye it is using is mutagenic and carcinogenic, might choose another safe blue dye. We improve the existing product in increments, changing what we can without fundamentally preconceiving the product. We look as wide and deeply as we can at what it is and ask if the problematic substitute is coming from the material or around the machinery used to make it. Step 4. Activate the positive list. Here is where redesign begins in earnest, where we stop trying to be less bad and start figuring out how to be good. Now we set out with eco-effective principles so that the product is designed from the beginning to end to become food for either biological or technical metabolisms. For example, if we are working with an automobile manufacturer, at this point, we have learned all that we can about the car as it is. We know what it is made of and how the materials were put together. If we are choosing new materials, for example, for the brake pads or rubber for the tires, we have to think about how they can enter biological and technical cycles safely. We have to use biodegradable paints and design the car for assembly so that they still plastic and other technical nutrients can once again be available to industry. Step 5. Reinvent. In this final step, we are doing more than designing for biological and technical cycles. We are recasting the design assignment. This means, if we are designing a car, 
we don't just design a car but design a new tree vehicle. Instead of aiming to create cars with minimal or zero negative emissions, imagine cars designed to release positive emissions and generate other nutritious effects on the environment. Everything the car emits is nutritious for nature or industries. As it burns fuel, the water vapor in its emissions could be captured and turned back into the water. Using fluid mechanics, tires could be designed to attract and capture harmful particles, hence cleaning the air instead of further polluting it. And of course, after the end of its useful life, all the car's materials go back to biological or technical cycle. It is all about pushing the design assignment further. Most transportation infrastructures spoil and devolve valuable natural land that could be used for housing and agriculture. Conventional development also depletes the quality of life with traffic noise, exhaust, and ugliness. A new tree vehicle introduces a new approach to highways. They could be covered over, providing new green space for housing, agriculture, or recreation. This final step has no absolute endpoint and the results may be an entirely different kind of product than the one you began to work on. But it will be an evolution of the product in the sense that it addresses the limitations you became aware of as you move through the previous steps. When we optimize our design, we open our imaginations to new possibilities. We ask, what is the customer's need? How is the culture evolving? And how can these purposes be met by appealing and different kind of products and services? Thank you for listening. With this video, we have now finished the Cradle to Cradle book.